Two. Hello, everyone. Sorry for that delay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, my God. So many books behind us. Hi, everyone. <laughs> it's Virginia Stanley. Hi, it's Lady. And it's Grace. And we're the Library Love Fest team, and thank you for joining us as we have another episode of Writers to Watch. It's the month of February. We've got some really wonderful authors with us today. They're coming from all over the place. We didn't even talk about that before, but we have authors from far and wide. And so we have uh, Alan Murren and Catherine Newman, Rainbow Rowell, and Wanda Morris. So, um, Lady Grace, is there anything we want to say before we bring on our first guest Catherine and Newman. We do have something exciting. I feel like I need a drum roll, but we'll just stick for now. Okay. So uh, we're going to give books away. <laughs> that was nice when that's the news, right? Like you feel a little bit like Santa. <laughs> so tell them the deal. Yeah, so at random, but please ask questions. The better, the, the more questions you ask, the more chances you have. We're going to pick five people to get all four, a whole set of print galleys of every book we talk about tonight. So I know everybody wants more print galleys. I do too, but, um, and it's not always possible or available, but we are going to make that happen for five people tonight. Ask questions, we're gonna do it at the end. So you'll hear from everybody. Put your questions in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can. And yes, we'll some people. I love that. Uh, do we have anything else we wanna say now or do we wanna leave housekeeping to the end? No, there's nothing. So tonight, everyone, you're gonna hear from these wonderful authors. Uh, Catherine Newman will be up first and then we'll hear from Wanda Morris, Alan Martin and Rainbow Rowell. And the format, as you probably know by now, is we ask the authors to talk about their books for about five minutes or so. You know, no no, no stopwatch here. And then we'll go through every, every author and then we'll bring everybody on and we open it up to questions. Uh, so please have them ready. If you have questions, again, like Lainey said, printed galleys, sets of printed galleys at random for those who ask questions. All right, everyone. Let's talk to Catherine Newman. Catherine Newman, are you behind that curtain? She is, because we just talked to her. I'm coming out. Yay! I'm <laughs> coming out. How are you? Hi, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Ah, we are so happy to have you here tonight to talk about your forthcoming book, Sandwich. Um, which is a delightful read, um, as is everything you write. Um, I am, we are such fans of yours. Um, and so I'm going to do a little brief intro and then Great. we're going to hear from you about okay. Sandwich. Um, so Catherine Newman has written numerous columns, articles, and canned bean recipes for magazines and newspapers, and her essays have been widely anthologized. She is the author of the novel, We All Want Impossible Things, which is a devastatingly beautiful book. Uh, the memoirs, Mating, Waiting for Birdie and Catastrophic Happiness. She's the author of the middle grade novel, One Mixed Up Night, and the best-selling kids life skills books, How to Be a Person and What Can I Say? She lives in Amherst, Massachusetts, and her forthcoming book, Sandwich, is a moving, hilarious story of a family summer full of a family summer vacation full of secrets, lunch, and learning to let go. Anne Patchett, we all know who she is, said, Sandwich is joy in book form. I laughed continuously, except for the parts that made me cry. Catherine Newman does a miraculous job reminding us of all the wonder there is to be found in life. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much, Virginia and Grace and Lainey and all the library people. I'm such a 
um, lover of the library. Um, I'm happy to be here. And I just, it's like, I could just listen to you read that Ann Patchett quote, like, we, like while I go to sleep, you could just read it aloud to me. But anyways, <laughs> um, so Sandwich um, is a book that takes place on Cape Cod. And it's a one week of a family vacation. And it's a, it's told the narrator is um, a woman in her mid fifties <laughs> um, who it is vacationing with her kind of semi-adult children and her aging parents. Um, so she is sandwiched right in the middle of these different generations. Um, and it's a vacation that they take every year. Um, and so the week has these layers for her of memory of being there since the kids were babies, since her parents were significantly younger. Um, and all of it kind of accruing in that weird Matrushka doll way where it's like all of the people, all of the mother daughter people she's ever been are sort of in this vacation. Um, and there are some secrets. Um, turns out a fair number of secrets that different people have. Um, there's a lot of nostalgia. Um, and it's also a book about a long marriage. Um, Rocky, that's the narrator. She and her husband um, have been together for decades. Um, and they're hitting that kind of midlife. Um, I keep calling it a book about reproductive mayhem, which I think makes it sound really less funny than it actually is. <laughs> but it's, there's some menopause in it. You know, I'm not, I, I hesitate to say that it's not everyone's favorite novel topic, but um, a lot of people live it. Um, and there's just a lot of family, um, just a lot of family on the beach. Um, and that's about it. I think that's what I want to say. It's just one of those moments in a life. Um, it's really just capturing a moment of balance where you know, it can't last forever. Her parents aren't going to live forever. They're very old. Her kids aren't going to vacation with her forever. It's just a moment in time um, captured in this one week. Mm. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for coming to talk to us. Oh, Catherine, you know, <clears throat> I that's a perfect description of this book because I don't really think it's about one individual thing. I was describing this to somebody the other day and it was pretty much like, it's a slice of life. And you know, when you, you started out, when this couple started out with these kids and going to this, this house, and I do like to, you know, I like that you make this house, not one of those glitzy, you know, sort of Hamptons-y house. <laughs> yeah, this it's not the greatest house. <laughs> But that's what makes it so relatable. It's like the plumbing problems with the toilet, but you keep going back and the kids get older and it's not, things don't stay the same. And so I think that's the beauty of this book truly to me is that there's a little bit of everything in there. She loves her kids. They're driving her crazy. She's, she's, you know, she's going through menopause. There's just everything. It isn't a menopause book. It's an everything book. It's just perfect. Ah, well, thank you so much. All right. All right. Should I check out here? Should I turn my camera off? Oh, well, you can. We can. That was wonderful. We're going to come back. People have your questions ready for Catherine. Um, and yeah, so if you want to turn off your camera, turn off your mic, we will move on to Wanda. We'll see you in a little bit, Catherine. Hi, uh, you, you're getting a lot of great comments on the title of Sandwich. Uh, I'm gonna welcome Wanda on screen and this is the cover of What You Leave Behind. We're so excited, hi Wanda. Hi, how are you Thanks. ladies? I'm good, how are you? Great, I'm great, Thanks. Good. We're so excited to have you on to talk about your next book. Well, we've, we've had you on a few times and it's Always super fun. I know you're a big library fan. So thanks for being here. 
I am. Thank you for having me. You know, I, I really do love librarians so much so that I put a library in my second book. So yeah, yeah. I do <laughs> love libraries. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Um, okay, so I'm going to do an intro and then I want to hear all about what you leave behind. So Wanda M. Morris is the award-winning author of All Her Little Secrets, which has been praised by Karen Slaughter as brilliantly nuanced and reviewed by the Boston Globe, LA Times, New York Times, Atlanta Journal, Constitution, Seattle Times, South Florida Cent Sun Centennial, I'm sure among many others. I also couldn't help but add that it is number one, the number one library reads pick for that month. We are very excited. And your second novel, Anywhere You Run, won the Anthony Award for Best Historical Novel of 2023 and was long listed for the prestigious Mark Twain Voice in American Literature Prize. Also a library reads winner. I had to add it in there. Alada is married, the mother of three, and lives in Atlanta, Georgia. And your new book, What You Leave Behind, has so much in it. I can't wait to hear about it. It comes out June 18th, 2024. And there's also a library hardcover. Um, so we're very excited. And please tell us more about What You Leave Behind. So sure. And um, first and foremost, thank you, librarians, for voting for my first two books. It was just mind-blowing. Um, but yeah, so what you leave behind is, um, I, I gotta say, it's probably, well, all my books are personal to me, but this one is is really so much so, um, I guess, because it gave me an opportunity to kind of unravel some things that I have been grappling with ever since my mom's death, um, which happened um over 20 years ago, but um, still, you know, um, grief kind of has a way of doing that. But um, what you leave behind is the story of a young woman named Dina Wood. And she is grappling with what I call a grand slam of misfortune. Um, she's recently lost her mom, as I alluded to, um, She's just gotten divorced and she's just lost her uh, very prestigious job at a law firm in Atlanta. So she goes back to um, Low Country, Georgia, Brunswick, Georgia, to kind of heal from all of this. And one day she encounters this uh, older gentleman who is li living in a trailer. Um, on some very expensive oceanfront property, just him, his dog, and a trailer. Um, and for some reason, it stays with her. She goes back, and the man has disappeared. And the trailer is gone, and the property is up for sale. And she can't let it go. She starts snooping, and then she uncovers a really dangerous scheme that um, essentially is uh, involves illegal land grabs and, of course, <laughs> my jam, murder. So um, she then sets out to kind of unravel um, the scheme. And in doing so, she becomes uh, the next target. Um, but fortunate for her, she winds up getting some help in a really unlikely source. Um, I guess um, the the book, I, I love this book because it gave me the opportunity to do a couple things. One, to explore um, the Gullah Geechee community, which um, are direct descendants of um, uh, African slaves that were brought to this country. Um, and they maintained a lot of their African traditions and they um, live along the coastal states, Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas. Um, and so this book gave me an opportunity to kind of pack it with the kind of characters that I love. Um, there's Uncle Duke and Rue and Butter and a whole bunch of other really great people that um, love and protect Dina and kind of give her a soft place to land. The other thing the book gave me an opportunity to do was to explore what I consider a crime out in plain sight, which is a legal theory called heirs property. 
And if you die uh, without a will or some kind of directive of what should happen with the disposition of your property after you die, then everybody that you're related to, cousins, siblings, parents, grandkids, they all inherit a fractional share of your property. And all it takes is one person to say, I think I'm gonna sell my fractional share. And then your property could be forced into a partition sale. So uh, a lot of people, particularly in uh, these low coastal um, communities, have been living on property that they've had since, you know, reconstruction, uh, since the end of the civil war. And without a will, then, you know, unsavory real estate developers come in, buy a fractional share, force the land to be sold. And even though you've lived on this property, you paid the taxes, it can be sold right from under you. And um, it's unfortunate, but it tends to happen in poor Appalachian communities, in uh, black and brown communities, in um, Native American um, areas. So um, it gave me an opportunity to kind of explore this and kind of, um, I like to read books where I learn something. And so I hope that in writing this story that I'm actually highlighting this so that people learn something, they learn something that's actually valuable and they can do something about it. They can be proactive about what happens with their property and their assets. So that is kind of, you know, my very long elevator pitch for um, what you leave behind. I hope that um, you all will get an opportunity to read it. I love these characters. I love this story. I think it's a story that's filled with, you know, not only grief and loss, but also hope and resilience, um, family, and um, the thickness of community and sticking together. Yeah, I there's there are so many layers. You have this really great thriller, thrilling story, but I have to say, I mean, one, the scariest things are always real, which is these land grabs, you know, like that's kind of the scariest part. But um, also I just, and I told you this, you're writing on grief and this, the things that made my heart stop the most are this all encompassing grief journey that she's on. And it's just some of the best writing on grief I've ever seen. So I think that that is a really thing, a great thing to shine light on too. You know, there's, there's just so many things to unpack. Um, just a really great job. And I would be remiss if I didn't quote, share this really great quote from Lisa Gardner. Um, a single sitting read, Morris brilliantly explores family ties, community injustice, and haunting grief all in one fell swoop. This is the kind of thriller that keeps you thinking long after the last page. Oh, wow. I, I love that. You know, like Catherine said, I could fall asleep listening to that. <laughs> That's what we so should do, lovely. bedtime stories from Library Love. We Sessions. should. Just quotes. Just quotes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get on it. Um, that one will definitely be included. So congratulations <laughs> and thank you for sharing. Thank you so much, Lainey. Right. Over to Jimmy. Oh, hello. Uh, now it's time to hear from Ellen Martin. Hi, Ellen. Hi. Hey, so happy to have you on. I mm -hmm. love the jacket of your book, The Coast Road. Do you? Uh, yes, it took a, it took a, I think it's always going to be a surprise. It took some getting used to. I had a, a moment when I saw it first, I was like, that is the cover of my book. <laughs> but <laughs> I had to kind of, yeah, I had to sort of like, um, I don't know what I thought the cover would look like, you know, but um. Yeah, it was it was a weird, it was a very weird sensation. I think it's always maybe going to be a little anticlimactic when you've worked on something for so long that you know a cover is going to kind of try and encapsulate all of that. But I think I'm I'm very happy with it now. Oh, that's so great. Um, that's lovely to that you've you've come to the point where it's sort of like, you know, you've gotten to the point where it's like, that is the cover. That's really cool. That's great. I'm happy for you. Um you know, I, I think it's arresting. I, I think it's so beautiful. Um, okay, let's let's get to the 
let's get to the meat of the book, but let me first do an introduction of you, Alan. Um, <clears throat> so Alan Murren, originally from Donegal, lives in Berlin and is a graduate of the MA in prose fiction from the University of East Anglia. He is a critic and art writer and his fiction has won or been listed for several awards. His debut novel, The Coast Road, tells of two women, a bohemian writer and a housewife in a closed community in Donegal in 1994. I just want to throw in this extra line that, that was in one of the press releases because I love it. Imagine the captivating essence of Big Little Lies transposed to the backdrop of 1994 Ireland, a time when divorce still remained illegal in the nation. Within its pages, this narrative offers a profound exploration of marriage, the intricate in intricate tapestry of female companionship and the weighty decisions that intertwine with the influence of the Catholic Church. Um, actor Gillian Anderson says, uh, the last great book I read, an early proof of debut novelist Alan Murren's The Coast Road about women in 90s Ireland negotiating the complexities of marriage in a country where divorce is legal, illegal. It will no doubt be a bestseller and I couldn't agree more. Um, Alan, thanks so much for coming on. I know there's a crazy time change and we're just thrilled to have you on. I love this book. Why don't you tell everyone what you want them to know about The Coast Road? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you to you guys for organizing this and for giving us the opportunity to talk about our books. And it's really interesting to hear everyone else talk about their work as well. Um, I think something that the cover captures about the book is it looks like Donegal, not just in terms of, I mean, when, when I first saw it, I was like, ah, that could actually be a, a cliff top in Donegal. And um, so for some context, uh, it's 1994 um, in Ireland at a time when the Catholic Church still had a real stranglehold on people's lives and morals. The story takes place 1994, 1995. And one of the things that's happening in the background and that some of the characters are aware of is that there's about to be a referendum on the legalization of divorce because divorce was still illegal in Ireland at this time. Um, and just as a side note, it's kind of an author note at the end of the book now, but the referendum passed, but it actually passed by less than one percentage point. So just to get people to get their head around this, that at that time, 49% of people still voted against the legalization of divorce. So it was a very narrow victory for the government at that time. Um, so it's also a time when Ireland was economically still finding its feet. Um, but the unusual thing about this town of Art Glass, it's a rural community, it's quite isolated. It's in Donegal, which is beautiful, wild, windswept part of the world. The most beautiful beaches in the world, I think, but it terrible weather. Um, and uh, But this town is actually economically quite prosperous. Um, it's a fishing port. There's a lot of money. Um, there's a lot of business there. There's a thriving industry. And I was kind of interested in observing and those class dynamics um, within a small community as well. And also because small towns are such the perfect places for drama to escalate where everyone knows each other and knows each other's secrets. Um, the story begins with a fire. A woman looks out her window at night and she sees a fire on the horizon and she knows that it's been set intentionally. And then we go back in time to, um, to find out the, the full story. Um, and the setup is a classic wonder returns. We have Colette Crowley, who is a poet who's married to a very successful businessman and she has left him to go and start, she has an affair with a married man in Dublin. She leaves her husband and her kids behind. And she comes back to try and reclaim her old life. Um, she befriends a woman called Izzy, who is married to a local politician. And she sort of uses this of Izzy as a conduit or go-between to gain access to her children because her husband won't let her, won't let her see her kids anymore. Um, and I would say that it's a book that focuses on three marriages and each of them poses a question. With Izzy is in a very unhappy marriage with her husband, James, and we're always wondering if she will stay. Uh, for Colette, we're wondering if she's going to get her husband back. And there's also a woman called Dolores who's in an abusive marriage. And I think all of us are hoping 
will she have the courage to leave? Um, it also deals with issues of um, something I wanted to explore was a lot of the victim blaming that happened that still continues to happen in Ireland, but was particularly prevalent at this time in the 90s. The media reporting on crimes against women or violence against women was often like so heavy on the victim blaming. Um, but ultimately, I think it's a love story to this place and to women of this time who were often funny, interesting, dynamic and clever and didn't really have an outlet for that and were often working against um, real limitations and difficult circumstances. And that is... Yeah, that is the Coast Road in a nutshell. Ah, what a nutshell it is. There's, I love the characters. I actually have to tell you, I started to do a little diagram on the back of, of one of my, the galleys because I'm like, okay, wait, I need to make sure I've got this straight because, and I, you know, by the end, I was like, oh, I know who they all are. And it's, um, I love their, I love their dialogue. I love their, I love their their women friendships. I love you know their, um, yes, they all have something that they are. Some of them have something that they're getting out of the other, like Colette, you know, who's doing anything she can to get near Carl, her son, and I, you know, it's just it's so loaded and it's so descriptive. I mean, when you first, as you say, start out and you know something's happened and the police are questioning her how did you know from two miles away that that was that fire was set and then you go oh well that's a whole new story and then you go back and I it's just a it's a great setup and it doesn't really even come into play for a while because you're so busy meeting these people and and learning what's going on with them and in such a, a small little town it's interesting how they know each other's they know each other's business yeah they sure do <laughs> okay um well thank you i love the priest too it's great oh my god you guys if you haven't read this you're going to have it's a wonderful rich layered just it's a fantastic read what a story thank you for writing it i you know it's unbelievable that you think it's only 1996 or you know whatever it's like how is that possible yeah, people keep referring to it as a historical novel. I'm like, what? <laughs> um, yeah, I guess it is. It's 30 years ago now. Don't say that. It's crazy, yeah. That happened. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Alan. That was lovely. We'll be back with questions, but that was perfect. Thank you so much. And now, Grace. All right. I feel like I almost don't even need to introduce this author, but Rainbow Rowell is here with us. Rainbow. I, there you are. Okay. Grace, you I I was waiting for myself to appear. I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I like I said, I feel like I almost don't even need to introduce you, but you are um the author of the forthcoming novel Slow Dance, which is on sale July 23rd. Um, and I'm gonna read a little bit about you. So Rainbow Rowell is the number one New York Times bestselling author of Eleanor and Park and the Simon Snow trilogy, as well as several other award-winning novels, short stories, and comics. Rainbow lives in Omaha, Nebraska, just like most of her characters. So again, thank you so much for being here. I am so excited to talk to you. And I know, um, I just wanted to say when they told us about you publishing this book with us, um, the entire room kind of of editors and sales people we were all like oh, there was gas the people on the line the virtual people were typing away and it was it was just very exciting and we're we're really happy to be able to talk with you tonight and I'm very excited for you know your your old fans who grew up with you to uh read this one and I think a lot of new readers are going to come to this and they have a great backlist to enjoy so um yeah thank you well thank you wow that makes me feel so good thank you so much um Thank you to my son who I, I'm getting over a cold and I had this fear that I, and I just drank my first cup of peppermint tea and I was like, quick, quick, bring it in as long as I'm not talking, but actually um, we were about to talk, so politics. Hello, everyone. Hello, librarians. Um, I also love librarians, but it feels a little insincere to say so now, right? Like everyone else loves and librarians, me too. Um, okay, Slow Dance. I'm excited to talk about Slow Dance. This is my first um, standalone novel uh, since Landline. 
It's also my first novel set in the real world. I've been in the world of mages for 10 years now. I hope for me to believe. Um, so Slow Dance, it takes place in Omaha, uh, like many of my books. It takes place in kind of a it takes place in kind of a rough neighborhood. We've got two really poor kids who are best friends, uh, Shiloh and Carrie. And everybody around them thinks that they're together. Everybody who thinks they're gonna end up together, Shiloh and Carrie, Carrie and Shiloh, they're they're inseparable. But they're not together. And in and in fact, they they're kind of rigidly not together because they need each other so much as friends that if they were to ever try to do anything more, I think they're too afraid of breaking what they have. Um, so they promise each other that they're never gonna change. What they have now, they're always going to have it. But then life around them changes. And because they're so rigid, it kind of breaks their friendship. So Shiloh and Carrie go their separate ways. Um, Shiloh mar gets married, she goes to college, gets married. She teaches theater, she has two kids. And Carrie goes off to join the Navy. Um, and when the book finds them, um, they have they haven't talked for almost 20 years. Uh, Shiloh is now divorced. And they, they we, we meet them again at a wedding, the wedding of an old friend. Um, and we see them come together and they have this window open in their life where maybe, maybe they're going to be able to figure out what they're supposed to be together. Are they supposed to be friends? Are they supposed to be more than friends? Or... Or is it possible that what they had in the past, which was so beautiful, is maybe the best thing they can ever have together? Like maybe that was enough. Maybe they should just, maybe when you have a friendship that true and a love that pure, you should just be happy with what you have and not constantly try to milk it for more for the rest of your life. Um, I've written a lot about young love. And something that I was thinking about when I wrote this book was, you know, what happens when you meet someone when you're young before you're really ready to be in love, before you're actually even able to recognize love, where, where those feelings are so new that you can't even really put words to them. And so it's almost a curse. It's almost more of a curse than a blessing to fall in love when you're that young or to find that person when you're that young because you're not really equipped to, to, do, to deal with it. Um, I was also thinking about how um, certain I was about things when I was young and how, you know, I'm surrounded by young people. Um, I have teenagers and I write about teenagers and for teenagers. And there is, yeah, young people are so certain about the world and about themselves. If I think about being 18 again, I thought that I was a certain kind of person and that, that there were things about me that were just immutable, that were never going to change. And um, everything was very black and white for me. And, and that's true of this main character, Sh Shiloh. Shiloh, as a young person, thinks that she has everything figured out. And when we meet back up with her and she's in her 30s, she realizes she has very little figured out. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm excited about the book. It's a very nostalgic book for me. It takes place in the 1990s for part of it and then the early 2000s, so 2010 for the second part of the book. Or there, It's not really first and second part, it's more like this. Um, so it's, it's like a double dose of nostalgia. Um, and I also feel like I, uh, for me, this book, this book has, this book takes, has a few kind of key scenes that take place at dances. And the feeling that I had when I was writing it was that important dance moment. You know, there's like one moment at a dance that's very important when people come together and they either connect or they don't. And, and feelings feel very big during that one moment, during that big song. Like in my youth, it would have been like a journey song. Um, so I had that feeling about writing the book that I wanted to bring in the feelings of those very special moments when your your life kind of opens up and you have an opportunity to really connect with someone. I don't know, Grace, does that cover it? I couldn't have said it better myself. Oh, good. I, okay. <laughs> there is good. a great moment. Uh, this is not a spoiler with uh, Hey Ya playing. So yes. just... Just to say it was it was really great. And I, I loved what you said about, you know, the teenager aspect where you kind of think like you're a superhero and you're very knowledgeable about everything. And then the feeling, um, you know, later in life, you're like, actually, I have no idea what's going on. I think be that like duality, people are going to come to at all ages reading this and being like, oh, that makes sense to me. Teenagers are who are reading this are going to feel, you know akin to one of those feelings and adults to the other so I, I just so. yeah it was a really really beautiful read and I I missed them at the end oh it's like 
give me these uh, you know like messy complicated characters back oh, so well you can call me and I'll just keep telling I'll tell you like what perfect. happens next and you know <laughs> where they like, go they do. like a bedtime story awesome <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> um thank you so much i'm gonna invite everybody to to come back on on screen cool um just to start there's a lot of love in the chat for everybody and a lot of i can't wait to read this a lot mm -hmm. of i got an early e-galley and it was awesome so yeah just wanted to put that out there yeah this is good this was this is fantastic i think just just the right amount of description um, and, um, and giving us what we need to know to, to jumpstart the conversation. And so now what we're gonna do is go to some questions um, and Lainey, Grace and I will ask them of some of you in particular and then for all of you. Um, and so the first question is actually for Catherine and it's from Sharon Stoneback. And it says, what is your favorite place to vacation with your family? Okay. It truly is Cape Cod. That's my short answer. There's a couple of different places in the Cape. We often camp in Nickerson State Park, even though camping is not part of this book, but we have camped in Nickerson State Park in Brewster, Massachusetts every year since my 25 year old was a baby. Mm -hmm. All right. My husband's like floating around getting ready for hockey. So I'm going to mute myself, but I'm here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Lainey, I think you have a question for Wanda. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have a statement and then a question, this lovely comment. It says, uh, Jennifer Winberry said, I love the title of what you leave behind because there's a duality between what you give up and leave in a situation, the physical property, but also memories that imprint on you. And I just thought it was a really beautiful comment and I'm glad you brought it up. Um, yeah. And then a question again from Sharon Stoneback actually. Um, well, you have a legal background and so that might, it, it informs a lot of your writing. And so she wants to know, did you know about the problem of land grabs and, and, death without a will before you wrote the book or did that kind of spur it on or what came first chicken or egg I guess that's a great question you know actually um the genesis of this book <laughs> came about one night when I was doing laundry I was folding up laundry in the bedroom one night and watching Lester Holt on the evening news and he was interviewing a woman um who um, her property had been badly damaged. Uh, I think it was Hurricane Florence had come through South Carolina and they were walking around her property and it was just, it, it was just devastating. And she told the story of how um, she had been on this property um, for generations. Her family had been on this property. Her grandfather was born on this property but she could not get repairs um, done because FEMA would not release funds to her because she could not prove title. She could not prove that she owned this property because her parents, her grandparents had all passed without a will. And so it became heirs property. And my heart just broke for this poor woman. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, like, this property has been in her family for decades and she essentially had no proof that she owned it. Um, and so I went back and I started digging around and thought, oh, wow, I kind of just, you know, got onto, you know, the internet one day and looked it up because even though I'm a lawyer, I practice um, employment law. So I don't practice, you know, real estate law. And what I found out was just um, kind of heartbreaking, um, the stories of people who have lost their homes, they've lost very valuable property. And that kind of, you know, planted the seed for um, for this book. Yeah. And that was back in 2018, I believe. So I had started thinking about this idea before I published my first book. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. Um, I have some comments, <clears throat> excuse me, 
And then a question for Alan. And thank you, Wanda. That's oh, it's such an interesting and horrific topic, but um, the way you treat it in this book is really so informed and respectful and really otherworldly. Um, so uh, there are, well, Alan, I'll let you know that there are a lot of people who are loving the cover of your book. Susan Riley says, the cover is beautiful and the story sounds really intriguing. I can't wait to read it. Julie Kodama says, I love books set in Ireland. Um, Susan Palmer Jeffrey says, I'm screaming. More books set in Ireland, please. So, Alan, do more. Yes. Um, so, uh, Jennifer Monaghan Winberry, we know her. <laughs> she says, what about this time period and the referendum captured your imagination enough to set a novel during it? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. So when I was deciding when to set the book, I, there was something about that particular time. I was, I don't know, my brain was forming. I was reaching adolescence and something about that time is particularly redolent with nostalgia. You know, everything is new at that point in your life. And I think you remember things and they're particularly vivid. But I have to say, then when I was thinking about the complexities of these relationships, having the divorce referendum on the horizon added another layer of complexity and tension uh, to the story. I didn't realize when I started to write the novel how big the, um, this kind of framework of um, divorce um, would become. And really, over the course of writing the book, it actually became about, I mean, the, su the subtitle of this book could be The Tragedy of a Bad Marriage, because if there's no way to escape from your marriage, you have to find a way to make it work. You have to find some kind of autonomy within that framework. And that was very interesting to me how you worked within those limitations so um didn't know it was going to be so um divorce referendum heavy when i started but that became a much bigger theme the tragedy of a bad marriage <laughs> very telling yeah um thank you um grace do you have a question for rainbow yeah, yeah. Lots of excitement in the chat for a new adult book for you. So the question I have, I'm going to give you kind of a two-parter, if that's okay. Um, half of it's for me, and then half of it is from uh, Zara, who is uh, writing in the chat. So my half of the question is, you know, you have numerous YA bestsellers and a great adult novel called Landline. And I was wondering if you have a different process or approach when writing adult novels uh, versus YA novels. And the second half of that is, how did you know it was the right time to return to, for writing to an adult audience? Um, yeah, I don't have a different process. And in fact, my first YA book, Eleanor and Park, was actually written for adults and published for adults in the UK first before it was published here as a, as a YA book. So I, I'm, oh, I just get the person and get the scenario and get the story and start writing it. And I don't, you know, especially at the beginning, I wasn't thinking like about the, frankly, the audience or where it would end up in the, the library or the bookstore. Um, but I, I try to sink really deeply into the main character. And so if you're, if you're sinking deeply into a 16 year old versus a 35 year old, the book's going to have a different vibe and a different voice and a different feeling. So um, no, my, uh, my process is exactly the same. And I think that that can be challenging for my publishers because it means from book to book, I'm, my my books are having like wildly different main character ages and genres even and then they're gonna uh, is that YA or adults so as far as like why did it feel like a good time to write about adults it wasn't an active decision it was more that Shiloh and Carrie's story came to me and um very suddenly and very completely and I felt like okay this is the story I'm gonna write now um it's interesting because it is a book that has two time periods and so that it does you do get the characters from their their po points of view as teens as, and as adults. So it's almost like the culmination of my books coming together and I found a way to do both. Thank you. Yeah, I always, I always wonder if like the audience is in mind when when writers go to, to sit down to write. Thank you. 
We have more questions coming in for all the authors. Um, back to Catherine. Um, one question that uh, has come up is, and you mentioned it in your uh, in your in your um, description, is about secrets, um, and and how do they relate to each other, and how do they move the story along? Um, and I think that uh, yeah, can you can you address the secrets that are in the that are in the book? Hmm. Yeah. Um... I'm trying to think. I, I think that um, there's something very um, compelling to me about the idea of a very close family. This is a very close family. Rocky's very close to her kids. She's very close to her parents. Um, and then there's this kind of question of um, things that you don't know. And some of it is... Um, kind of genealogical there's some um some deep family secrets and um some of it is rocky's own secrets and um and i think um i think for me that's just another kind of layer of um this way that we uh try to know each other and um this way that we're all kind of interdependent and taking care of each other as families, as communities. And then there's layers of stuff that you don't know that either is revealed or isn't revealed. And I guess I'm just interested in that. So I think that's why it came out that way. I get that. Um, Go ahead, Lainey. Sorry, let me interrupt. Um, so Wanda, Thank you for sharing, you know, you said grief was personal when you were writing this. And so Beth Thomas wondered if it if it was cathartic writing this or was it harder writing this with the grief aspect? Um, because you're balancing a lot in this narrative, but you, at the end of the day, you're kind of working with something deep down that affects you in your daily life, so. That's a great question. The, it, it, there is a scene in the book, and if you read the book, you'll you'll know. Every time I wrote or revised, or even now when I read it, that scene makes me cry. And I contemplated um, taking that scene out a couple times because I thought, oh, this is going to be a drag on the book. Um, <laughs> but... Um, it, it was so real. And even to this day, like I said, my mom died over 20 years ago and that scene, um, is still so real and raw to me. And I think that it, um, I think it, it adds to Dina's character. It, it makes her who she is in the book and um, kind of the decisions that she's made um, kind of come out of that particular scene and what happened at that time. And so um, that was hard for me. And, and like I said, if, um, if anybody ever asks me to read it, I'm sure I'll turn it into a professional crybaby. But um, yeah, I think that was probably the most difficult because I think with grief, um, I think you use the term nonlinear, which is is perfect that, you know, it kind of comes and goes and it's in waves. And so, you know, there's some days that, you know, I would be perfectly fine. And then there were other days I didn't want to get out of bed. And um, so you know, now having some distance, I'm able to, you know, kind of maneuver through that and write about it. But like I said, there is that one scene that that is still, um, it, it's still pretty personal. And that one was really difficult to write. Yeah, yeah. I have a question for Alan. Thank you, Wanda. Um, are there specific elements of Irish storytelling, such as themes, narrative techniques, 
or character archetypes that you consciously draw upon or reinterpret in your own writing? Hmm. That's interesting. Um, I, I don't think it's necessarily a specifically Irish thing, but one of the inspirations for the book um, was, uh, I think, The Green Road by Anne Enright um, and also Olive Kitteridge. I think what those both of those books have in common is a difficult and complex central female character that some people think is an, in their community think is a nightmare and other people really love, you know, and that is and that was something that I wanted to that was a um something that I was going for was somebody that your central character going, oh my god, this woman is a nightmare, but I love her and I want her to succeed. Um and uh yeah, but other than that, um, I mean I read almost exclusively, I would say, Irish and American authors. That just tends to be where my my tastes lie. And um the sh short stories of William Trevor, probably that's my kind of Bible that sits on my bedside table. Um and his writing has been a great influence on, I hope has been a great influence on me. Um, and uh, I mean, I guess the you said something about um, the prologue where you said um, it, it's very short and the, uh, the detectives are questioning this woman and then they say, you know, but what about, how did you know the fire was set intentionally? And she says, oh, that's another story altogether. And I was kind of trying to draw attention to the self-conscious nature of storytelling in Irish life. I mean, it's almost like Izzy is stepping outside of it. She's saying, and now I'm going to just tell you a really good yarn. Yeah. Um, and there is certainly that element to it. There's also, um, you know, in um, small town life, there's the way in which gossip creates truth. And um, I think that is something that is often explored in um, Irish literature and that I was interested in exploring also. Yeah, wow. Thank you. I love what you just said about small town gossip. I think that rings very true. Um, I have a question for Rainbow um, from Sharon Stoneback. She says, why do you think we as adults still remember and reflect so often on our teenage years slash experiences? Um, yeah, I think that um, we feel things really big in our teen years. And I think we feel things, you know, we think we both, one, you remember the first time, you, you remember first times in general. And there's so many first times in your teen years. And then I think that, you know, everything is bigger. So the pain is bigger and the joy is bigger and the, uh, the elation is bigger. Um, I, and I, and I, I have a lot of also's. I also, I think that, uh, when you're a teenager, you're really working out for the first time, kind of who you are, um, and, and you're settling into your adult self and making a lot of choices that stick with you for forever. Uh, you know, we send people to college when they're 18 and they have to lock down. Um, and it's, I, I think it's an absurd age to have to lock down in any way, um, and to have to make big decisions at 18. And some of us are making big decisions about who we'll spend our lives with at that age or whether we're gonna have children. So you're you're really making decisions hard and big and fast when you're only just capable of making them or not capable of making them. So it, I think that we all look back at those years, one, because they're so sharp and memorable, but two, because it's where we made a lot of the decisions that led us to where we are now. So we're even if you're happy with your life now, you're going back and you're thinking to where you were when you took that fork in the road that, that you know, you, you take some big forks at those ages and you can't go back. Um, I, I often write about people meeting and falling in love when they're young. And, and I've known my husband since uh, junior high. So when I, this person who I'm with every day I'm not just seeing him as he is now. It's like I'm looking at him and I'm seeing this line all the way back to seventh grade and this person who who goes back into my own past. So 
Um, I think that even if you don't marry someone who you knew when you were young, you're still, you know, you're seeing the people around you and you're looking in the mirror and you're not just seeing who you are in that moment, but you're looking all the way back to who you've been. Um, so yeah, I think we can't help it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that answer. And I think it reminded me of something that Carrie says in one of the scenes about, I think your teen years have a lot of those like built in like memory maker moments as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. I think that like that breaking of your routine is really also why we remember things so, so vividly from our teen years. So thank you. Thank you for that. There's a comment by Janelyn Kocher or Coker. I'm not sure how you pronounce her name, but she said, I feel nothing but relief that I am no longer a teen. <laughs> um, there's a question here <clears throat> that I think that is for, there's a lot of there's a lot of conversations about journey and don't stop believing that's taken on a life of its own. Um, but I should never I'm, have mentioned it. I'm sorry. Are you kidding? That's the best. <laughs> um, let's see. Of course, now I'm trying to find it. Um, if hmm. wait, I, I think need... I found it. Oh, okay. From Julie. Yeah. All right. Uh, Julie says, I would like to know what book each author would recommend and why. That's a good question. So wh whoever can start if it, if it moves you. Just a book in general. Yeah. Any book. Oh, just a book in general. Mm -hmm. I can't think of a book. I'll start. Really, the question is just what book do you recommend and why? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I just read a book called The Dead Avocado. Have you read this book? Um, how's it by? It's, it, it, I, I just read it. It's excellent. So I'm gonna look it up. Um, I hated the main character a lot. So much so that I kept thinking, I'm not going to recommend this book to anyone because I can't <laughs> find this character. Um, it's kind of a Holly Golightly character. So if you love Holly Golightly, which a lot of people do. I've seen the posters. Um, you might like this book. It's by Elaine Dundee. Um, uh, and it takes place after the World War II in Paris. It's like an American living in Paris, a young American woman with money to spend. And um, she just drinks and she acts and she sleeps with men and she doesn't sleep with men. And um, even though I disliked her so much by the end, I thought this book is brilliant because her voice never breaks. Um, the voice just never breaks. It's just bubbly and um, smart and wise. And uh, you really feel like it's, you know, the late 40s in Paris. Um, so I recommend The Dun the Dead Avocado by Elaine Dundee. I love that. I also love anything that starts with, I wasn't going to recommend it, but now I am. I need to know. Like, you've got me hooked. I need to know. Love it. Um, I'll recommend one I read recently, which is out of my typical, you know, I, I write mystery and thriller, um, but it's a horror book and it's called Spite House by Johnny Compton. And man, that, that book, um, I'm not going near any kind of freaky looking houses anytime soon. His, um, it's about uh, a young father who has run away with his two daughters. And you kind of don't know, you know, you know something has happened with his wife and the three of them have taken off and they're running and they wind up becoming kind of caretakers for this um, this house that is, is haunted. And his descriptions, and I... You know, I always consider myself kind of a, you know, scaredy cat, um, but I will read a little horror. And his descriptions were so vivid in this book that I could picture this house. And um, I remember reading that book late into the night one night and um, then being afraid to get up and go downstairs when I needed to go get some water. And I just thought, oh my gosh, um, I, it was so immersive. I think that's why I recommend it. Um, so if you're into horror, I recommend Spite House by Johnny Compton. Hey. I can also um, recommend, 
recommend something that I've read recently, which is a book of short stories by an Irish writer called Neve Mulvey. And the book is, the collection is called Hearts and Bones. Um, and I, do, I just found it, I, the stories are vivid and memorable. And I think um, every character was thoroughly convincing. Like I believed in them as living, breathing beings despite the sort of desperately sad and unusual situations they found them in themselves in. So, yeah. Mm. God, you sound wonderful. I have another desperately sad recommendation, but it's really funny. And it's like my favorite book to recommend. And I always recommend it because I always find all these people who have never read it. It's Miriam Taves, you know, spelled T-O-E-W-S. Um, and it's all my puny sorrows and I it's just the I always think of it as like my ideal funny heartbreaker um, it's so I read it like to be inspired as a writer honestly ah these are wonderful recommendations I know I'm, I'm gonna go on goodreads and add everything to my my tbr yeah um so we're at the 801 time spot, but there's a question that Grace wants to ask, ask everybody that's been written in. It's in the question. So go ahead, Grace. Let's just, make this I, the last question. I think it's a great end. I think it's a great note to end on. Go for we'll it. All, it's, it's very much Rainbow Rowell inspired. Will all of the authors tell us what their big slow dance song would have been at prom? <laughs> I love this. I really, really did. So <laughs> that's hard for me because I didn't get asked to prom. Um, yeah, I was that kid. Yeah, I, I was that kid. It was, yeah. Um, if it was like mine, you didn't miss too much. So I, <laughs> it's okay. Um, I slow danced to um, that police song, Every Breath You Take, that turned out to be a song about a stalker, remember? But we were like, God, it's so romantic, which I think sums up like my entire teenagerhood, honestly. <laughs> I cannot even remember what song was a slow dance song when I was that age. I have no recollection i just keep thinking of like the slow dance scene from napoleon dynamite where they were listening to forever young and maybe <laughs> that could be my song that's right it's gossip become truth alan that's it that's the song you listen to that's the one uh wanda i did get asked to prom but i refused to dance with the boy who asked me because i was too self-conscious to actually go out onto the dance floor and dance so I watched him dance with other people all night um, yeah <laughs> but uh my high school even though I graduated in 1991 we were all stuck in the 80s and um so we listened to a lot of Journey and Sticks so the the song that I think of is like the ultimate slow dance song that I listened to a lot right while writing this book is Babe by Sticks. like as soon as it I hear the first few you know notes I'm like <gasps> Also in <laughs> Ireland, uh, prom is called Debs. The Debs. Oh, really? Yeah, like Debs. a Debbie's mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess you go to your Debs. Mm -hmm. Love that. So that's well, like those... a country where I could not dance with anyone. A Debs. <laughs> I kind of want to hear from Laney in Virginia about your slow dance. Song. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, mine I was Goodbye Doesn't Mean Forever by. Was it bread? I don't remember. I can't it's a remember. Great song. Yeah. Honey, I don't know. I feel like it's probably like Aerosmith, like the what's the one that's um that's a slow dance? Oh yeah. Like yeah, yeah. I could oh what's that? I don't know the name I can't think of the name of it the, right now. I don't um, know. Just to feel you breathe. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, one. Yeah. Oh, oh that, I feel like yeah. it's something like that, like oh, yeah. you know, an, an older song for us, but it, I don't know. Don't I, I that is that it? No. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah that's okay. it. Like something really dramatic, you know. I feel like we were a dramatic crew. There, Grace, <laughs> come on. <laughs> we yeah. I graduated high school in like 2017. So I feel like it was we definitely danced to Snow Patrols Chasing Cars. 
Nice. <laughs> we know what I'm talking about. Yes. It, That's an older song though, isn't it? Yeah, d- yeah. Yeah. So I remember it being, it was probably like an older, like the mid 2000s that song came out. But I know for sure, like Ed Sheeran played at our prom. Like I, <laughs> it definitely <laughs> happened. <laughs> it definitely <laughs> that's so funny so there's there's the slow dance songs if anybody wants to chime in and tell us what your slow dance song is the chat room is still open (laughs) but the um but i think the conversation has wound down have we have we gotten to everything i think we have some questions for some overlap balance uh two people had the same question why you wrote um you know what inspired you to write your book and so we picked only one of those, but um, is there anybody else who's got a question that we haven't addressed? Grace Laney? We're good. I think we're good. Um, okay, so there we have it. This was a great hour. Uh, four really different books, all equally wonderful, great page turners. You learn a lot, you're entertained. There's no good place to stop, honestly. Um, on any of these books, we have um, Catherine Newman's Sandwich, which goes on sale June 18th. Alan Murren's The Coast Road goes on sale June 4th. Wanda Morris is What You Leave uh, uh, goes on sale June 18th. And Rainbow Rowell's Slow Dance, July 23rd. Uh, what You Leave Behind, I'm sorry. Just, I keep getting something in my throat. throat. <clears throat> anyway, there we have it. And this was such a wonderful wonderful hour of conversation thank you all so much for um for taking the time alan it's late we're gonna let you go soon but we have just a couple of um of our housekeeping notes laney you want to talk about them real quick and then we'll say goodbye to our authors yeah and librarians. yeah thank you everybody just a few last minute things before we go We love doing this and bringing amazing authors to your screen, but we also want to hear from you. We don't know what we don't know is my favorite thing to say. So we want to know if any time changes would work for you. It's a new year, new us, and we just want to make sure we're bringing the same old programming. You're welcome. Um, So fill it out and we'll put the link in the chat. And then the next one we have is our spring preview. I don't know. Do you want me to continue or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, sure. Okay. The next is our spring preview. Hear about upcoming books. We have a lot to get through in our 75 minutes or 90, whatever it is. So go to this library journal page. We'll put it in the link in as well. And you can register. You'll get notifications and we're going to buzz books for you. It's our, I say world famous and we're going to stick to it. Um, And then Gala Gap Fest. We're doing something fun for our meetup on of the month. We're having cookbooks as a theme. So you're going to hear from Priya Krishna for Priya's Kitchen Adventures going to do a um, cooking demo. And then the Library Love Fest is going to probably do a much less impressive <laughs> cooking demo from some other cookbooks. And I mean, well, I speak for myself. I shouldn't speak for the rest of the team. But mine will be less impressive than, than Priya's. Um, some other cookbooks we're going to tell you about because that's what we've heard that you want to know more more cookbooks and then you get a sneak peek of next month's writers to watch these are three authors who are confirmed and we have one more coming but we can't put it up yet <sighs> okay I think that's it thank you Lainey thank yeah. you Grace and one more one more slide of, of our author's books tonight which would be nice to just put them up there Catherine, Rainbow, Wanda, Allen thank you all so much for taking the time to talk with librarians, with us. Um, it's a it's an honor. It's a it's just a, a beautiful thing that that we get to do this and we can't do this unless you all make the time to do it and you so graciously did and we thank you so much for that. So happy reading everyone. Take good care all and thank you again. This has been a great night. Thank you for having me. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Night, everyone.